we asked you in your journal to think about why people go through the system in this cyclic fashion sometimes. One of the key reasons can be that cyclic consumers fall through the cracks of our systems. Even when a system is designed to address people who are in the margins of society, it still has to be a system. It still has to have a core and target audience, and it has to have a structure so that it utilizes limited resources in the most efficient and effective way possible. What this means is that anybody that enters the system that has particularly complex or unique needs becomes what we call in social services at risk, meaning they're at risk of simply being failed by the system. And within social services, our usual response to this is to seek out the informal supports that a person may have in their life, their family, their friends, maybe their neighbors, or their larger community, to help fill in the glue or be the glue that fills the gaps so that the person maintains the professional services that they need. And those people may help out in ways such as ensuring that information is passed on to the consumer, monitoring the consumer's condition, ensuring that the consumer gets to their appointments or their gets the prescriptions filled or has a continuity in their care. But what happens when an individual doesn't have those supports? In some cases, a person may simply have outlived or moved away from the family and friends that they otherwise might have accessed. And this is quite common for seniors who are experiencing disorders such as dementia. In some cases, a person's mental health symptoms might have caused them to be alienated from other people. For example, perhaps their behavior is disruptive or odd and makes others uncomfortable, or perhaps their symptoms cause them to be suspicious of other people. In some cases, as we discussed earlier, people experience so much stigma that they are unwilling and un uh, un uncomfortable with sharing uh, the fact that they have a diagnosis with others who might have been support people because they're afraid they're going to be rejected. And sometimes they may actually be right in that. If a person experiences a chronic drug use problem, sometimes people sort of follow the drugs. They leave the family behind and end up following the people who are providing them with or enabling them in using a substance. And this can sometimes mean that people end up in communities that are very foreign to them. They have no orientation to the community and they haven't developed any relationships except with others who are drug users or suppliers of the substances that they need. And the last group is a group of people who have learned to be distrustful. In some cases, they've had bad relationships, not only with professionals, but within their families. Not everybody's family is smooth sailing. And in fact, some families have more than just one individual who's experiencing psychosocial issues. So there may be some very complex psychological phenomena going on in a family. To give you an example of how this happens, I was encounter encountered a, a woman who was a senior and she had moved away and uh, she at that time did not have any chronic mental health needs but she described to me how she had lived in a home where the light bulb in her staircase was burnt out for six months and this woman didn't have any natural light in her staircase so she was at risk of falling and breaking her hip every time she went in and out of her home she simply did not have the ability to connect up with anybody to help her with that well that was a bad problem, but what happened downstream was even worse. As she began to experience, experience associated symptoms of dementia, this became an even more prominent issue because she had absolutely no connection to people. And she began wandering in the community speaking to strangers. Fortunately, some of those strangers began to connect with her enough that she got some connection to, for example, a pharmacist at the local drugstore. This allowed her to have a certain amount of continuity of care. Now she struggles a great deal still, but even that informal support has played a valuable role for her. It's very important therefore for us to move beyond, where necessary, our patent job description. Just because it's what's written on the piece of paper doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the most effective way for us to spend our time. We want to do things that are going to help us to meet the goals that we set out to do. Not just when we started that particular day or that particular job, but when we started out with our career ambitions. And we have to think about what's going to actually make a difference. The good news about this is that it's likely to be the most efficient use of our time and energy as well. And so we want to think about that all of the time as we're approaching the individuals, the people that we're supporting. The second thing that we want to talk about is not only that people often lack the informal resources in the form of their family and friends, but they often also lack other forms 
of resource. For example, they sometimes simply lack knowledge. And that knowledge can sometimes be very frustratingly obvious. For example, I spoke with a woman recently who struggled with drug addiction and she described how she had walked past a facility for approximately six weeks before she finally decided to poke her head into it and find out what it was. It was really quite simply a matter of it not being very well signed for her. The people who had put this program together had intentionally located it in a community where they knew lots of people had substance use issues, but it wasn't immediately apparent as you walked by what the service was about. And the woman might have come in the door anywhere from one to six weeks earlier had she known what was going on there. And the second area for us is transportation. It's amazing how often people qualify for services but simply cannot find a way to the services and that's a real chronic issue within our community. Sometimes these things merge together where people simply don't know about the transportation amenities that are around or they have transportation and they know how to get to a particular facility but they don't know that that facility includes another program that might work well with their overall service plan or health care plan. I dealt with a situation that was very much like this. We had an individual who was working towards living independently. He had lived in a staffed group home for a number of years and was working towards a number of goals that would allow him to move into his own home. And the day came when that was possible and we found him a beautiful quaint little house that was situated in a country type setting. We knew that he had access to handy dart from this home, but we never realized how much this little detail would make a big difference for this individual in terms of his overall life goals. Because after he had moved in and had settled in, it was time for him to go back to his job. And his job played a valuable role in his overall care because now that he was living independently, about the only place that he was seeing a great deal of staff support would be in his workplace. But we went to reschedule his handy dart and found out that handy dart didn't come to this particular neighborhood at that particular time. And it was astonishing for me to find out that there was no flexibility whatsoever within the system to try and help this man accomplish such a large goal. The good news is that in the end we addressed this again by looking at informal resources. We were able to find somebody that he knew well and who was able to allow him to spend some time at his home every morning and that the home he was going to was accessible by Handy Dart at that time. And so we turned what was essentially a negative into a positive where both people got to socialize each with each other every morning over coffee and the gentleman was able to continue doing his job but it required us to look beyond the obvious, to be innovative, and to really be committed to this individual as a person. There are a number of people who simply don't qualify for services, and sometimes the reasons are almost um, banal. Sometimes it can be really difficult to understand why an individual doesn't qualify. For example, if a person is sentenced to serve time in a provincial prison in British Columbia, they will not be able to access psychosocial programs. But if they are put into a federal prison, there is a comprehensive array of programs. In many cases, people don't qualify simply because they're too old or too young, or because programs are specifically targeted to men or women instead of both. At the root of this cyclic consumer phenomenon, we can still look at negative stigma. And we talked about negative stigma in module two, but we have to remember that it is not something that is just an amorphous phenomenon. It has a direct and actual impact on people with mental health needs. And here's an example. If we are talking about a service or an area where many, many people are affected or where there's a group that is considered socially valid, for example, children or women, we will see that there is more advocacy, more uproar within a community when services aren't meeting needs. But when it comes to community mental health, there isn't much advocacy. And this is sometimes mystifying to those of us who work in community mental health because the same group of people might be, for example, complaining about drug activity or homelessness in their neighborhoods are also sometimes opposed to improved mental health services. And they don't necessarily see that there's a connection to improving services and reducing those social problems. There can be a reluctance for people to access care as well because of stigma. Even when it's in their neighborhood, 
the idea that one would go in the front door to a service is sometimes difficult, particularly in smaller towns where people report that they're worried others will know their business and see what's going on. And we spoke earlier about the idea that sometimes people have to make a very difficult choice between accessing professional services and being connected to their family or to their overall community. In many cases, people report that if they were to access services or take medications, they might lose the support of their family and be rejected actively. And I think at the end of the day this is not good math because people need to have those services and the family support. But if they have to choose between one or the other, I think it's probably a safe argument that in most cases people are better off being connected to their family uh, than they are to choosing the professional supports without having family. But it's a very difficult choice as you can only imagine for people, period. All of this leads to a spiraling effect for people. They have a mental health symptom which then causes them, for example, to lose their job. This in turn can cause the person to stop having much of an income, putting them in the poverty bracket. This might mean that they have to live in a different neighborhood or not be able to use transportation. And this means they may not be able to access the services, for example, that would fund them or that would be funded for them. So you can see how this whole thing becomes a comprehensive array of issues and it can be difficult to see where one needs to start in order to address that cyclic consumer's needs. You can also see that it requires a great deal of collaboration. And if you look at the job descriptions of most of the people they're encountering on a day-to-day -day basis when they're in crisis, whether it's police officers or paramedics or emergency medical doctors, you can see that none of those job descriptions involve connecting to other people. And this is exactly why cyclic consumers continue to exist. They keep coming in the door, they keep being dealt with by these people whose job it is to be reactors, to be crisis responders, and there's no connection to the people whose jobs it is to be proactive responders trying to help in the long term. And that, at the root of it, is what we're trying to address in this course and particularly in this module. For many people, their needs are extremely complex and they can exceed local resources. Once again, this is especially true when people live in remote areas. And again, we make people make tough choices. If you live in a small community in British Columbia or anywhere in Canada, the United States, and you want to access sophisticated professional services, there's a significant chance you're going to have to leave behind your family, your job, the things about your community that are otherwise major assets in you maintaining your mental health. And it can be touch and go as to deciding which of those things is more valuable. What is the best way to keep balance in a person's life? And in a community like Mission, many people are accessing their doctors through walk-in clinics. And this creates what we call the clinic effect. People don't have a continuity of care with their physicians because they're going in and seeing whatever physician has the most access at any given point. Who's on shift? Who has the, slow, the, the lowest wait list? Who's still taking patients that day? Now, in Mission and in many other communities, we have what's called a division of family practice, which is evolving. And one of the advantages of the division of family practice is that there is one commuter, computer database that is being shared by our local physicians so that with the click of a button, a doctor is able to quickly access the records for a patient and find out about their history, what medications they've been prescribed, and so forth. But it's not a fail-safe system because there is this intangible characteristic that comes from building a relationship with a patient on a regular basis. You start to build trust with them. You start to be able to detect sometimes otherwise very subtle changes in their behavior and in their symptoms. And they're more likely to be able to tell you on an ongoing basis by virtue of observing them what's going on. You'll see differences and be able to detect not just what they tell you, but what you can see. Sometimes the symptoms may deter a person from proper care or towards wrong care as well. And what we mean by this is that many, many consumers have mental health needs that send them out there not just looking for a doctor who's going to make them well, but looking for a doctor that is going to give them medications, sometimes that they will use illicitly or that they will sell, uh, or they're doctor shopping, meaning that they're looking for a doctor who will not question or challenge perhaps psychosomatic symptoms, for example, with hypochondriasis or factitious disorders. And we'll talk more about those disorders in Module 8 if you're not familiar with them. But essentially, the disorders where a person's 
issues are manifested as physical symptoms or physical complaints when in actuality the person is probably experiencing psychiatric root causes. So if a person is going in and out of clinics or even if they're simply going and, and utilizing more than one physician, family physician, and they're using this type of behavior, then it can be difficult uh, uh, for us to make sure that we're not actually causing them harm. One of the other things that makes it difficult to care for people who have these complex care needs is determining what is their primary disorder. And for those of you who haven't taken module one, we learned that primary and secondary mean simply what disorder came first, what disorder is the more causal disorder. And there are some people, for example, who utilize a substance because they're self-medicating from some other psychiatric disorder such as depression or schizophrenia. But there are other people who actually develop the mental health disorder like schizophrenia or depression as a result of chronic use of a substance. So it's difficult if you don't have continuity of care, don't have insight into an individual, don't have a connection perhaps to their family or friends where you can get other information, to determine whether a person's needs start with a substance abuse disorder or start with a mental health disorder from another category, or even whether or not there are other underlying issues such as intellectual disabilities or personality disorders. These take sometimes an extended long-term relationship with the patient so that we gradually evolve towards helping that individual. And it's not written into this slide, but one of the most complex things that can happen is when an individual doesn't respond as we would expect to particular medications. Now, I'm not a physician, but I've worked with many, many people over the years who utilized psychoactive medications. Many people, when you would take them into the doctor, would get a prescription and they would respond well to that very first prescription. But there was always a percentage of people who seemed to constantly be struggling to find the exact balance of medications. Their, their medication needs didn't seem to work when there's only one medication was in play and they also tended to sort of have evolving mental health so that even if something worked well for a few months, eventually it started to falter. So people need continuity of care, particularly when they fit that group of people, that category, because it can be a very difficult thing to titrate medications up and down and find that correct balance. And it's important, again, for professionals and for family members to coordinate with the physician to make sure that we're providing the, the life supports for people outside of the medical uh, when they're going through those medication changes. Things like making sure they have stable housing, that they have supported relationships, and so forth. One more reason why people may have difficulty and may fall through the cracks is that they have had very bad past experiences. Informally, I've asked many of the people over the years I've encountered who were, who were or had been homeless and asked them why they didn't go and get services. They've given me many of the, the, the reasons that I have identified for you previously, but the most common answer, single most common by far, is that people describe their experiences in other healthcare facilities as being essentially undignified. They didn't always use that word, but they described phenomena that would fit that description. So for example, they were told they couldn't go to that place because they, didn't, they couldn't bring their possessions, or they had difficulty complying with the rules, um, or they didn't want to have to participate in all aspects of the program, and this was particularly in places that were faith-based. So we need to really think about the dignity issue for people because most of us, when we think about it, would risk our physical safety if we thought it was going to help preserve our emotional and spiritual well-being. We do not like feeling disrespected so much that we will, and there's an expression as we all know, bite off our noses to spite our faces. And it's something that's deeply rooted in the human, uh, human experience, the human psyche. We want very much to be respected. We want very much to be empowered. We want very much to have influence over ourselves and over others. And when those things are compromised, we're willing to sacrifice almost anything. And this is particularly true of individuals who have personality disorders and who may find it extremely difficult to navigate structured rules in an environment. That doesn't mean we can't have rules, but we have to be strategic in how we communicate rules to people who have habitual ways, often dysfunctional habitual ways, of resolving the, the stresses in their life. And so if we ask them to come in and the very first thing that we say to them when they begin a new service is that there are a number of rules they need to follow, that will often be a very alienating thing 
and is one of the main reasons why people either may not engage care or may not continue the care that we're giving them. We can't have any discussion about the issue of uh, cyclic consumers without talking about caregiver burnout. Caregivers not only burn out because of dealing with cyclic consumers, but burnout can actually feed this phenomenon of the cyclic consumer. One of the things that can happen is that we can have negative experiences with an individual or a few individuals, and before we know it, as a result of critical incident stress syndrome, we start to reframe our way of looking at our work and at the people we support. For example, I worked with a woman who was a very strong advocate for one of the supported individuals in a group home we worked in together. And she would advocate for this individual even when this person was aggressive to staff or other consumers, and she worked very hard at helping other people to understand that they needed to continue this philosophy of a client-centered approach. Then one day, the client acted out aggressively toward her. Now, this wasn't the first time he had done this. She had always managed to be an effective advocate even before. But in this particular incidence, there was an element of a sexual assault. He specifically targeted one of her breasts and grabbed her and bruised her breast very significantly. The change in her outlook was dramatic. She went from being a strong advocate on one day to being a strong advocate that the man be locked up, that he be treated as a criminal the next day. Now, it's important for you to understand that I'm not suggesting that this woman's response was unnatural or immoral. It was quite natural and quite understandable. What she needed was a tremendous amount of support from her coworkers and her employer, and she needed people to help her resolve what she had gone through. It was very traumatic for her and it went well beyond what a person should be expected to deal with in their job. And it was quite likely that she wouldn't have been able to continue in that job placement if it weren't for the fact that this individual later on decompensated to the degree that he had to leave the facility. He couldn't stay there any longer. But in the particular instance, this particular situation, it was important for us to address at the root this staff person's psychological needs so that she could return to her job and be effective or move to another facility and be effective there. Many of us as caregivers try to be martyrs. We take uh, too many liberties with our own self-care working far too many hours, living off of coffee, not eating correctly, and most importantly, not taking the small blows that happen in day-to-day -day work seriously. And before we know it, we've actually become jaded about our jobs. Many of the first responders I've dealt with over the years, particularly those of the older generation, have scoffed at the idea of debriefing after a crisis. But it is proven by multitudes of research that this is a very important process in helping people to feel better about their jobs. And when we don't do it, the, 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 the research is very dramatic and frankly somewhat scary uh, because people are actually more likely to be spousal abusers, alcohol and drug abusers, and even suicidal when they don't properly attend to their self-care. So we have to take our breaks, we have to take our holidays, we have to get exercise, we have to sleep right, we have to make sure that we don't prop ourselves up with substances, even legal substances such as cigarettes and coffee, and if we don't do that, it will gradually take a toll on us and we'll be less able to support individuals. If we walk in the door and we have unrealistic expectations, we're also going to be much more likely to burn out. We have to imagine what we're likely to be able to do in small increments. In 12-step programs, they tell people to think about one day at a time. And when we're racing race cars, they tell you to pass one car at a time. And it's the same thing here. We really want to think about moving forward more than we're moving backward. We have to expect that we're not going to have every single day end up with a net forward motion. Some days we will have net backwards motion. But overall, if we can say that we are doing our job in a way that is moving a person forward, we should feel proud of ourselves. We should be happy with what we're accomplishing. 
We also need to remember our own individual supports and resources. I worked for an agency that had an employer, employee assistance program and later withdrew it. And the reason they withdrew this very valuable resource was that nobody used it. And I was astonished by this. But I think it was an interesting thing where a bunch of mental health service providers didn't want to take advantage of a mental health service themselves. And it's a vital thing for us to do that. And whether it's a professional service or just personal resources in our lives, we need to use them. Go home and speak to your family and tell your friends what's going on in your social life and in your professional life. Now, you can do this without breaching confidentiality. We can talk about things in a general way. As long as we're not identifying people, and sometimes that's done with names and sometimes it's done with other details, as long as we're not identifying people, we can ventilate and seek out help for our, service, or our personal needs uh, any time and we need to make sure that we're doing that. If for you meditation or worship is important then make sure that you're doing those things as well. For many people it's about a creative outlet making sure that they have a way of transforming some of their uh, angst and stress into something that's positive and constructive. And we must not forget what I call our ghost team members and I call them this meaning that they're invisible to us. We have to remember that we do not work in isolation. Before we ever started to work with a consumer, somebody else, many times, many, many others, have already provided service to that person. And after we're finished working with that person, many others will be along to help out as well. And even as we're working with that person, there are other individuals, sometimes we'll never meet them or even know about them, who are also supporting that person. We cannot imagine that we have to do it all on our own and that we have to do it all in the, spe in the specific and limited amount of time that will be where be with that individual. Again, our aim is to help that person be better off as a result of the time they spend with us, not necessarily that they will be 100% recovered by the time they're finished being with us. We need a team and we need to, if possible, connect with others on that team. One of the things that we can do that can make this possible is not only to reach out to those who might be working alongside of us with an individual, but also to make sure that we create good records and leave behind as we transition away from an individual a record of the things that we've done and what has been effective for a person so that if they go on to other professionals or even informal individuals they can communicate in a more concrete way what their history has been what has worked and what has not worked and that's going to help reduce some of that cyclic user phenomenon. Let's get you doing a journal entry what do you think about the reasons that were given in the previous slides for cyclic consumers? How does the system and the people working in it explain this phenomenon? In other words, when you think about the reasons you hear from other people, why do they think there are cyclic users? And are these explanations factual or myths in your opinion? 